Hey everyone, how you doing today? It's uh, class, I believe this is class six of Recording Studio Fundamentals, spring 2022. And um, I don't know what it's like down there in the city, but we've got three inches of snow here and I'm only 70 miles north of there. So yeah, <laughs> a lot of snow coming down. Um, how's everybody doing today? We're going good. Good. We're light. Some students still. Um, so we've had a couple of a uh, couple of students have had to leave the class because they've had to withdraw from the college because of personal situations, and I feel really bad about that. I just, you know, um, yeah, I feel bad for them. I just hope that they've sort of taking care of getting official withdrawals and stuff like that so it's not on their record uh, in a negative way. So we're going to be transitioning not completely away, but away from MIDI, right? You have a first draft of an assignment that's due today. I'm going to give you feedback. Hopefully tomorrow um, I've cleared up time in the morning to make feedback videos for everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you'll be handing that in next week. So um, today what I thought I'd do is present some material that I've not presented before. So I've done some research and I've put some materials together. So if my presentation is a little halting at times, it's because this is the first time presenting this material. So, uh, but I think it's, it's important. And then we're going to spend the second half of the class reviewing MIDI, uh, MIDI stuff. And then starting right with next week, which will be the Pretty much the ha about halfway through the semester, uh, we'll be getting into audio a little bit more fully. Um, and your first assignment will be an audio editing assignment. And I'll have the files for you to edit and everything. And it won't be that difficult, but uh, it's important to start making the transition to audio. So you won't need the audio interface and a microphone for the next assignment. But if you um, have not yet picked that up from the college, it would be good to start getting that together now, uh, the kits that you've signed up. So if you've all right, so those are, they come in a Pelican case. So the, you know, the, I'm not sure how easy it would be to carry it on the bus. Uh, you might need to ride to the college, uh, but you would coordinate that with Justin, um, on the sign up sheet there. So what I want to talk about the first part today is the we've there's a difference in creating music. Most people who are musicians typically create music from written written notes. Now there are a lot of musicians that can't write music, but maybe they jot things down on paper. Like, for example, Bob Dylan, when he would write songs, he would be with a typewriter writing out all the lyrics. And, and then maybe on, with a pencil, he would just jot down the names of the chords. You know, he didn't write down the melody notes or anything like that. But it was done basically uh, using some sort of mechanical notation. That's a lot different than the way that we're creating music now, where the computer is, you're creating a performance and you're recording it. And what we have available to us now is an astounding amount of technology for not really that much of an investment when you compare it to even 15 years ago. So uh, what do I mean by that? Let's go here and let's open up our materials no that's not what I'm looking for give me one sec ah here we go okay um, let me actually put this in into the uh, chat so you guys can have this PDF. It's got links to the stuff that we're doing. All right. 
let's see, let's make this bigger so that everybody can see this and read this. Great. So today we take for granted the software in our computers as a vital part of the compositional products process. The amount of technology available, even in a laptop with a modest investment in software, would easily have cost hundreds of thousands of dollars in the past. So, for example, what we like, the technology in our phones is so far advanced compared to when I first started using computers in the 1990s, right? It's just the amount of memory in here dwarfs the amount of memory. I had uh, four megabytes, megabytes of RAM in my first computer. I stored things on 1.5 megabyte floppy disks. My first external hard drive was 750 megabytes, and that cost me $750, right? So you think about a dollar per megabyte. And you you can get a phone for seven hundred and fifty dollars that has one hundred and twenty eight gigabytes of RAM in it, and the processor is so superior to what was in my first uh, Apple LC two computer. And so you could, if you just juxtapose that out across the entire spectrum of technology used for recording, you can see like. If you go back further, stuff that you could have a studio that's packed with gear that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Well, you have a computer and it costs a little some money. And if you're, let's say, a Mac user, yes, Macintosh computers are more expensive than the uh, corresponding Windows computers. And this is not a comment on the quality between Windows and Apple. I just happen to use Apple because I'm used to it, and Windows computers can do ju- you know easily as good, and in some cases better than Apple computers. Um, it just all depends upon what you have. But if you buy an Apple computer, what you have access to, and again, this is not a comment on the quality, but you have access to Logic Pro. I'm not a fan of Logic Pro for composing. Um, it's a, but it is a great piece of software that people do amazing stuff with, right? So this is a couple of hundred bucks for this. And, you know, it's basically almost like the history of recording inside of a piece of software, you know? So let's take a look at... Okay, so I'm looking for... Ah, here we go. Plugins and sounds. Right, so you get all these plugins. It dwarfs what Pro Tools comes with. This this part of it, much much more, much better, much more in depth, much more current. So one thing that uh, that Avid has done, and I've complained about this, is uh, let's say you get. Um, the latest version of Pro Tools, and you've got a subscription. They give you access to a lot of plugins. Well, some of the plugins were made in in the in the mid two thousands, and they're giving you to the, the, as those like they're new, and the technology for the like they have model they they have models of what's called a Fair Fair Fairchild compressor that was done by Bomb Factory like two thousand six two thousand seven that code has not been updated really for 15, 16 years. And there are other companies that like Apple that are now offering similar types of physical modeling of hardware gear that's been, that gets updated and it's newer and the code is better. They sound better. Right. So, you know, Avid needs to really up their game with that. So you get, let's say you get instruments with, with pro tools. You, I mean, with uh, logic, you get a sampler, very, very full-featured sampler. Not as good as Native Instruments Contact, but you can do amazing stuff with this. You get Quick Sampler, which is, you know, you just it's just very easy to use, so it's a light version. And then you get the Drum Synth, Drum Machine Designer, Drum Kit Designer. You get Alchemy. This is a, a third-party software that they purchased from, I forget the name of the company, uh, but this is an amazing synth uh, 
virtual synthesizer. And then you get all of these. The sounds here are better than what's in uh, Expand 2. And you get these soft synths like ES2, which is very good. Some vintage keyboards, which are really good. Retro synths. So you get all of this, all of this stuff. And then you get effects. You get remix effects. You get different kinds of reverbs and e like modeling EQ, right? So this is based upon um, an API graphic EQ from the API, which is a, a great American uh, mixing console. This is based on the pool tech EQ, right? And then this is uh, like a Neve EQ. So they give you vintage modeling. They, and then this compressor here, it's got one, if you look here, it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different kinds of compressors. Right, each one models. It doesn't look like one of the vintage compressors, but it models the behavior. And so, you know, you, like I don't. I'm, Logic is a couple hundred dollars, and like I said, I have some problems with Logic um, in, in in the way it works. It's not my favorite. I have lots of problems with Pro Tools too, but you know, it's it's just. But it is an incredible piece, incredible value for what you get, and. What all of these things enable you to do is they enable to you, you to start thinking of your computer as a recording studio and as an instrument and part of the compositional process, right? So if we think about um, recording studios, right? Re recorded, like if we think about how long people have been making music, there, there are uh, artifacts from that are sixty thousand years old, right? And if we take a look here, this is a flute, a Neanderthal flute, right? This is sixty thousand years old. This is found in uh, southern in southern Europe, southeastern Europe. Right. Let's take a. Okay, so that's in a foreign language. I didn't actually see this before. I thought it would be in English instead of reading these um, subtitles. But basically, right, it's, they found it in this cave here, and this is in, um, in this area here, right here, right? So that's, I believe that's the former Yugoslavia. So it's, you know, in, in southeastern Europe, 60,000 years old. So think about that. People have been making sounds, organized sounds, for 60,000 years. So um, and, and the thing about playing instruments is that they could only be experienced in real time while the person was performing on them. So if this was 60,000 years ago, the only way you could hear that instrument was to be in the presence of the person that was playing it. You can obviously hear things in your head, but the only way to experience a performance was to be in person, right? The first example of recorded sound was in 1860. And let's take a look at this by a French inventor, Edward Leon Scott de Martinville. Edward Leon Scott de Martinville. Anyway, he's using his invention of the... F right, and we can just listen to the, these people talking. I mean, it sounds bad, right? But you have to think that this was 1860. And um, it was called the phone autograph. Now, in 1877, another 17 years later, the phonograph, which was invented by Edison, right, right near us here, right in 
the New York Air, City area, was the first reliable machine made to capture audio. And by the early 1900s, recordings started to become popular. So there was a song called Crazy Blues by Mamie Smith, and it sold a hun- one million copies in six months. And this hit also helped create blues as a category. So the next bit here was that jazz followed. Think uh, King Oliver, Louis Armstrong, and then, you know, in quotes, hillbilly, hillbilly, hillbilly music. And if you think of the soggy bottom boys in the film, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? And then during this time, most of the recorded music was reproductions of live performances from people playing instruments or singing. Right, so basically you'd buy a phonograph and you'd play it in your house and it was of people playing instruments. So basically trying to capture a snapshot of a performance. The audio quality obviously wasn't great, but it's actually a miracle, in my opinion, that they were actually able to create this stuff. And, you know, like imagine like in... in ni- selling in 1920, 1915, whenever that was, a 1920, a million copies of, of, of a disc. That's, an, that's insane. You know, I, I don't know how many millions of people were in American back then, but 60, 70 million people? 50 million people? So that meant like one out of every 50 people, 60 people owned, owned the recording. That's tr- tremendous. Um, so... So this went on, you know, and then you had very historical recordings that were made like Louis Armstrong and the Hot Five, Louis Armstrong and the Hot Seven, you know, all, all like jazz and mostly from New Orleans. Uh, there was a guy in the night, Alan Lomax, who's a very famous uh, music, I don't know if you call him a musicologist, maybe a music archivist might be a better term. And basically, I didn't put him in this presentation because... Uh, but now I'm getting a little tangent. But he basically took a, something around with him into the fields, basically, where you'd find like people in the backwoods somewhere playing an instrument. And he'd capture them, and you know he, he created a whole library of recordings. He, he actually uh, was the p- person who recorded Muddy Waters for the first time when he was a teenager, uh, the great Chicago blues man. Um, he recorded Robert Johnson, the, the blues guitar great that has influenced like uh, many of the 1960s rock bands from England in particular. And he just recorded a lot of different kinds of folk folk music, basically, at that time it was called. And a lot of these recordings are now in the Smithsonian and the Library of Congress. But basically capturing music that wasn't really notated so that if you think about it this music was passed down like from mentor to student or f- from you know from father to son or mother to daughter you know just just passed down directly from person A to person B and then once these r- recordings started archiving this music it became available to a wider audience to save and pass this music on that people 50 years later could be influenced by something recorded in 1920 and or 40 years later. And or 1930, 30 years later in the 1960s, they could be re- influenced by this. They'd have these recordings and people would try to figure stuff out by, by ear, especially with Robert Johnson and, um, You know, it became not only a commercial enterprise where you're trying to sell records, but it became an educational tool. There, there's plenty of stories about Charlie Parker taking Lester Young records and playing them on a little portable Victroller or whatever they called it, and he would slow the recordings down because they had the different speeds. They had 78. They had 45, 33, 16, and slowing it down so that he could pick up every note. And even though it was in a different key, it didn't matter. He would learn all the solos note for note, and then he'd learn them in all 12 keys. 
And so there's plenty of stories about Charlie Parker doing that. And everybody knows that if you're a jazz musician, you listen to recordings and you transcribe them. And so technology and recording definitely aided in the advancement of different American music styles um, because European music was largely written out. So you had the scores to study. Uh, so, for example, we have scores that go back a thousand years. We have some kind of notation. Uh, we have the music of the, from the Renaissance. We have music from the Baroque era. We have music from the Classical era, from the Romantic era. We have people, uh, we have the Second Viennese School, the autonal music, uh, the music from Schoenberg, Weber, and Berg. You have Stravinsky, Bartok. You've got all, you've got Luigi Dalla Piccola, who taught at Queen's College, an Italian composer. And um, you have all this music that you can actually get the notation. And you can study the notation. But you can also now study the performances. So performers, because then start classical musicians started being recorded. And there, there was a series, maybe 15 years ago, 20 years ago, called The Great Pianists of the 20th Century. And uh, was it RCA? I've got a bunch of... I, the HMV was closing by my apartment on the Upper East Side, and they were selling every all CDs for like $5, and I went and I bought like, I don't know, a hundred... Like, seriously, like, I don't know, I bought like 40 or 50 CDs for a couple hundred bucks of all the great pianists from the early part of the century that I'd never heard before. Um, Michelangelini, uh, Joseph Hoffman... Uh, Wittgenstein, all the, all these incredible pianists, and the recordings of how somebody performed something became a document, and they became especially important with, say, somebody like Arthur Rubinstein, who is one of the greatest pianists of all time. He was alive during Brahms's life, and I believe that he even knew Brahms, so when he was playing Brahms, it was almost like you were getting it one step removed from the composer's intent. And then that becomes documented. Or you would get the student of Chopin playing Chopin, or the student of Liszt playing Liszt. And then, because that stuff was not that far away from when the technology caught up to make documentations of the recordings. And so then we have no idea really how Baroque music was performed. We're making you know, educated guesses based upon what musicologists say and standard performance practices. But we do, starting with like the late Romantic era, we do have people who are, you know, were students of the composer or students of students of the composer that were made recordings. So you would be able to get something that was a little bit closer to what the composer's intent was. Bartok himself was an incredible pianist, and he performed, as did Stravinsky. He wasn't a great pianist, but he certainly performed, and he certainly conducted his works. And so you could get a good idea. These people were alive when recording was, was prevalent. So with 20th century music, it became a way of helping to decipher the intent of the notation. But with a lot of American music, jazz and blues, it became a way of passing down oral tradition or, you know, mentor-student tradition. Uh, and it also became a way of documenting music that, may, that might have disappeared into the ether because it wasn't written down and there was no other way of knowing about it. And because of people like Alan Lomax, you have a, a documentation of all this. So you could see how in the 20th century, recording music became very, very important to in, in, on multiple levels, right? And But contrast that with, you know, 60,000 years ago, they found an instrument. We're talking like 150 years of recorded music, and the first 30 or 40 years, the music sounded horrible, right? It, the, the recording technology wasn't so great, it wasn't until the maybe the 20s that we got stuff that actually started that can sound okay today. You know, you can listen to Louis Armstrong and the Hot Five and the Hot Seven and get a really good 
idea of what that sounded like. Um, not a complete idea, but you could hear it's certainly better than nothing. That's for sure. So reproductions of live performances from people playing instruments or singing. Then we get into about the 1930s, and as recordings are starting to become more and more prevalent, people like Stravinsky and others started thinking that at some point people would create music specifically for what they called the gramophone or the phonograph. So this leads us into the 1940s and something called music concrete or concrete. And let's get... Um, So these are two Frenchmen. This is uh, Pierre Schaeffer and this is Pierre Henry. And they are um, at this place called Studio de Sai in France. And so this fellow here, he didn't have a lot of musical training. But what he did was they started that studio as the center for the French resistance during the Second World War. So they would use that to record things that they would go out over over the airwaves uh, to, to, you know, help rally against the Nazi occupation. And they started using the technology that was becoming more and more prevalent at that point to create soundscapes. And one of the things that they created was this thing called Music Concrete, right? So this is defined as a composition that uses recorded sounds as raw material. Recorded sounds as raw material. So is there a style of music today that uses recorded sounds as raw material? Rap? Hip-hop? Sampling James Brown, putting him into a like a hardware sampler in the 1980s and, and 1990s, and writing whole tracks around the recorded performance of James Brown, uh, you know, or or hundreds of other the Amen break, which is a we'll we learn and we'd go over in Audio MIDI one, but that's a drum fill from this single called Amen uh, from the early 1970s. And there's this really great drum break in the middle for uh, eight eight bars, and that's been sampled and been put on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of recordings. Bob James, the the, the great jazz pianist Bob James, a lot of his recordings, like Nautilus and uh, others, became the basis for huge hit songs by people like Run DMC. Uh, Bob James is is actually the most sampled musician in the world. Uh, in history, I believe. Um, and so you can see that it, it wasn't really a new idea. The implementation of it was new, but the whole idea of using recorded sounds as the basis for a music composition goes back to the 1940s, right? So this is the beginning of the idea that the studio is an instrument that creating a compelling musical recording requires more than just simply documenting the performance, but rather taking the sound, capturing it, and then manipulating the sound using studio technology and combining multiple recordings together to create a, a finished product using the studio and its technology as part of the compositional process. All right? So... That's studio music concrete. Then there became something soon after that called electronic music, which there's a French term for it. That's different because with that, your the sound sources are generated from electronic devices in the studio as opposed to music concrete, which is capturing sa recording sounds and manipulating them and using those recorded sounds as the basis for your composition. So, um, right. Okay, so this Studio de Sai was founded in 1942 by this Pierre Schaeffer fellow, this guy here, right? And it was used as the center of the French broadcast resistance during the Second World War. He used the technology in the studio to create radiophonic works. 
So radiophonic works are sound effects for radio broadcast as background, used as background music. So that under dialogue and voiceover. And then he started his experiments in music concrete. So he, these two guys collaborated together and started to record the, the, this new method of organizing sounds. So basically what he did was he would record sounds onto discs and then use technology in the studio to further manipulate the sounds. And then he'd employ mul basically multiple turntables with individual sounds on each turntable and then use a collage approach to combining the sounds. So let's take a listen to um, one of his songs, Etude au Chemin de Fer, and that's a study for by combining the sounds of trains, all right? And you have to realize this is like 1943, 42, 44, 45, whatever, it's going to sound barbaric and raw and not slick to our ears. But you have to realize that at this time, this was advanced and groundbreaking stuff. Okay, I think you get the gist of that. Now, you know, that sounds a little like it, it is organized and it's very raw, but 1948, right? This was groundbreaking. Nobody had ever done this before. Um, and you can hear that the sounds of the train have been processed. You can sort of make out that some of the sounds are, you know, you can tell that that's a, a whistle from a train, but they've been processed by different treatments. They've been put on to, you know, eventually the music all ends up from those discs onto a, a tape, and then you can hear the tape splices uh, in a few spots where they put together different sections. So that's interesting. Then um, they did another one a year later called Symphony for... Symphony pour un homme seul. Right, Symphony for One Man Alone. It's and it was premiered at a concert in March 18th of 1950. 22 movements of music produced using turntables and mixers. Right, using turntables. Right, that's a big thing now. You have you know two turntables and a DJ. Um, and it was difficult to perform due to technical problems. So then they reduced the number of movements to 11 for a broadcast in 51. And then they revised it again, right? So this stitches together bursts of machine and industrial noise, incomprehensible speech, spastic rhythms, and frantic piano rums, runs, and he referred to the composition as an opera for blind people, a performance without argument, a poem made of noises, bursts of text, spoken, or musical. So let's take a listen to this. 
We're not going to listen to the whole thing. That's about three minutes of that. Now, you can obviously tell by listening to that that that's kind of that would be kind of almost impossible uh, to create live with musicians and record it. Right there, there's you can hear that things are murky. It sounds like there's reverb added on, and electronic processing on the sounds put through filters, uh, tape manipulation. So. It's, it's just a, a different way of organizing sound, which is what music is, organized sound. So this went on in France and then over in England. Let's, let's get over here. Uh, this woman here was named Daphne Oram. All right, so this is an early recording console. This is more advanced than what they had. But though there are the two guys. That's Pierre Schaefer. And you could see, right, they've got these, all of these sound shaping devices over here, ways to treat the sound, the tape machine, multiple tape machines. And these VU meters here. That's Daphne Oram again. You could see just what the technology looked like back then. That's her again. And this is later on. I'm going to talk about her, but what she's doing here is she's sketching onto 35 millimeter film stock that you would shoot a movie with back then. And I guess that these squiggles somehow created sound when it was played back. 
This is a guy named Bill Putnam. And that's him with Nat King Cole. This is We're, we're going to get into this guy next week. And this guy as well. This is Joe Meek. But I just want to give you a sense of the equipment. So this is probably in the 1960s. And uh, this is probably in the 1950s, late 1950s. Notice they're all smoking, right? Yeah, this guy committed suicide. Uh, it's a tragic life. Um, okay. So that woman, Daphne Oram, she started working at the BBC as a balancing engineer. So basically back then, what a balancing engineer would do would be to take, if you were recording something, uh, two things. You would, you know, balance the sound of the instrument so that it all got onto the one track of the tape at the right volumes. Or if you were doing something for the BBC that had a dialogue and other sounds in the background as underscore, you would balance the sound between the dialogue and all the background noises. So what she did, the way she differed from the French was that she started using electronic methods to create sounds. And this also happened during World War II. She started working at the BBC. So she would take those electronic elements and then blend them in with orchestral recordings manipulating both sound sources to create her musical works. Now, the way that it was similar to Pierre Schaefer and Pierre Henry and the music concrete was that the tape machine became the medium of her audio experiments and allowed her to explore entirely new realms of possibilities. Right, So you take a sound, any sound, record it, and then change its nature by a multiplicity of operations. She explained in a 1957 production, you can record it at different speeds, you can play it backwards, you can add it to itself over and over again, you adjust filters, echoes, acoustic qualities, and you can produce a vast and subtle symphony in its sort of modern magic. So in 1958, she launched something called the, the Radiophonic Workshop. And it was used to create sound effects and jingles for advertisements. And we're going to watch a jingle right now that she created. This is called Tumble Wash. actually got kind of like a funk beat to it. Do your wash the new way, the tumble wash way. The Liberator tumble wash costs only 75 guineas, and look what it does for you. It washes, it rinses, and it spins, all in one tub. Turn one dial to heat the water as hot as you want, Turn another dial to wash with a gentle tumbling action that forces suds through every fiber. One lever rinses till the water's crystal clear. Another lever spins. You never touch the clothes yourself until they're spun and sparkling clean. Wonderful tumble wash. The only 75 guinea one tub washing machine. Made by English Electric. Made to last. Okay. Interesting, right? So, it, it, one, one, thing that's, one thing that's really cool about going to a college, music college that has a long, fairly long history like Queens College does. I mean, the music department's been around since, I don't know, 1930s uh, in one way or another, uh, is that people 
come into the department as teachers that um, have a history. For example, we have uh, Luigi Dalla Piccola, who is a, is a fairly well-known Italian 12-tone composer. He taught at Queens College in the late 50s and early 60s, and he composed a piece that was performed at Queens College by the faculty. And I actually wish we had this, but at my teacher's house, he had, uh, there was a teacher named Castellini who taught at Queens College, who was a conductor, uh, and he had his conductor score of this piece that had everything written out in hand so that it was all on like, you know, two, two or three staves with all of his conducting moves. It was really interesting. And as you know, Jimmy Heath taught at the college for over a decade, and I studied as a graduate student. George Pearl was a professor. He's a very well-known uh, well, Pulitzer Prize winning composer, and he also was a, a, an authority on the music of Alban Berg and Webern and Schoenberg. Um, and when I was a graduate student, I studied composition with Thea Musgrave, and she's still with us. She's about 90 now. And she is a Scottish, mostly opera composer, she's known as, and she studied with Nadia Boulanger in Paris. And, um, She's she's an incredible composer, and she was a really good teacher, too. I really liked taking classes with her. But um, she collaborated, she studied in in, Brit in England as well, in London, and uh, before she went and studied with Nadia Boulanger, and then she lived in London. And she worked with Daphne Oram, this woman here, and let's go, they wrote a piece called Four Aspects, and it was composed as a lecture and demonstration given by or at the Edinburgh Festival in 1959. So that's where Thea was from, Edinburgh. That's up in Scotland. Uh, Scotland. Four Aspects is one of her earliest masterpieces, and it's a collaboration with Thea Musgrave. So electronic audio manipulation and engrossing layers of tape feedback. Let's take a look at this.
so you know there's the PDF there all of these things are linked in that PDF uh, I, I just want to look at one for one thing hold on a second yeah so this is not what I'm looking for give me one sec Uh, here we go. So this is Professor Musgrave. And I just want to go to where she's I'm talking. I'm way back somebody. And in London, there was this Daphne Oram who started the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. I mean, way back when. <laughs> she said in the early days, she used to have to work at night when the place was basically closed, so she would have the recording equipment in the gents' bathroom and then would be running down the corridor with the mic to get the distance effect. I mean, all this, of course, you don't need now. But I remember working with in, in her studio and we had loops hanging up all around. You don't need that now. People, Young people now working in this have no idea what it was like when it was all new. And in, when I was studying in Paris in the 50s, you know, we talked about musique électronique et musique concrète. So electronic music, which was basically sound waves, very boring to work with, and, and uh, musique concrète, which was from live sounds, and that's what I liked. I didn't like the, the sine waves and things. They were not interesting in themselves. So, but that was all the begin, really the beginning of things. So... I, yeah, I delved. For certain works, I've worked with that. Sometimes I use actual real sounds. I, I wrote a, once a radio opera, because when, when I was a kid, I did, we didn't have television. You went to the movies to see what was happening in the war. You didn't have television at home. I mean, people can't imagine that now, let alone not having internet, but not having television. Oh, Okay, I just thought getting it right from the horse's mouth would be um, an interesting, an interesting diversion. Anyway, she was she was a fantastic professor. I really enjoyed uh, studying with her, and um, you know, I have this. When I was studying with her, it was in the 1990s, and I was playing piano in the Broadway show Miss Saigon, and you know, I'm in the pit, and right at the beginning of the run. Uh, I w they moved. I got moved after about six months to a different part of the pit. But I was right under the conductor was up there facing that way, and I was right under his left arm. And next thing I know, I'm warming up for the show, and the the, the pit ended right here. And then you know I could reach through the uh, reach up here and grab somebody's foot in the audience in the front row. That's how close the people were. So um, I'm in there warming up and I hear somebody calling my name and I look up and she's like, she's in the front row, like sitting right in front of where I'm playing. Maybe very, very uptight <laughs> the whole night that she was sitting there. Um, anyway, uh, really, really, really interesting person. All right. So now I'm going to do the next part of this next week. This was a lot for me to prepare for today. And I also didn't want to spend the whole class doing this, but I want to do the next part where we start moving more modern uh, stuff that sounds better uh, from the 60s and 70s and right up through more current stuff. But you can see how the the studio becomes part of the compositional process and it allows you to create soundscapes that you can't do when all you do when all you do is capture a performance. And I think a really interesting thing that's evolved now is that you have a combination of the two where you use this, you capture a performance and also enhance it by using stuff that's available in your little tiny computer studios. And what I'd like to do now is I'd like to play you a video, I don't have the session anymore, of a piece I wrote called Sounds, Sound is Everywhere or Music is Everywhere. And I went around with my phone and I have a, a little, a nicer microphone that I could stick on the phone and I just went around a few days uh, and I captured sounds. I was in Florida, and I had the sounds of some birds in a palm tree above me. I was walking we were back here, 
and it was mid-March and there was still frozen, things frozen and I was walking with the dog and there was a little, like not a pond, but where snow had melted and there was water and it sort of froze. And so I took some rocks and I threw the rocks onto the onto the ice there and captured the sound of that. And there's a bunch of different different things that I captured and sort of this is uh, music concrete. Uh, and I did this, I don't know, probably like three or four years ago. So let me get this up. We can follow along the session, but we can't really, um, I can't open it up and analyze it because I don't know where it is, which is really a bad move on my part. I can't believe how sloppy I was. Okay, let's take a look and listen. And see what sounds you can recognize. So those are all acoustic sounds that I've manipulated. And let's let me play it again, and I'll tell you what some of the sounds are. I forget how I manipulated them. So the very first sound, which is this track up here, I've also made my pointer bigger this week so that it's easier for everybody to see. Um, this is water in, uh, like in a bowl that I'm sort of swishing around. This blue track down here, I have a small greenhouse on the side of my house and very heavy snow was hitting the glass on the greenhouse and I captured that. This track right here, this I captured with my phone. It was, uh, there's a place in Big Sur, California called Nepente and it's got this room filled with wind chimes and it's, un and it's overlooking the uh, Pacific Ocean. It's really amazing. So I was there one day, and the sound was incredible. I just whipped out my phone, and I captured it. This purple track here, these are birds in a tree, right? And then um, this green one here is, these bottom three tracks are snow in the greenhouse that I've manipulated. Right here, this is waves from the ocean that I slowed down. These, This is, um, I captured some geese flying close by and I made it in slow motion. So those are kinds of the sounds. Let's listen to it one more time and I'll point out the sounds as they come in. I'll just take it from here a little after. So this is the ambient water. And this is snow on the greenhouse. Right, and you can hear right here, these are birds. You can hear, wee, 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 and then this, you can hear the chimes coming in. So 
So now the green one at the bottom is more snow on the greenhouse. You can hear slow motion waves there. And that high pitch thing, that's the... Yeah, you can hear that. Right, the slow motion waves and the greenhouse. Four chimes. So I've got some stuff in reverse here. You hear that flipping sound? Birds come back in. Snow on the greenhouse sound design, played around with the timbre, processed it. The birds are cracking. And then that high, almost sounds like a choir. That's snow on the greenhouse uh, windows, right? So it's just really completely transformed the sound. So you could see that the, the principles of that music concrete can be applied um, very, I, that probably, once I started working on that, it probably didn't take me that long to put the composition together, probably like a few hours, right? Uh, to treat the sounds and then to organize everything and place it on a timeline. Um, but you can make unusual sounding stuff that you can't get people to play. So any questions on that? No? I have a question. Yes. Um, what kind of microphone did you use? For for oh it's um the the tracks that were in mono were just the, the microphone that was on an iPhone and you got to realize probably that was like two iPhone generations ago, but there's I used something made by Shure called an MV something or other. Let's see if I can find it on my my on my phone. No. Uh, MV88. It's this right here. Where did this picture go? Oh, give me a break. This right here. It's okay. You know, I mean, it's it's definitely better than the microphone from the phone. Um, I would say it's it's okay. I wouldn't call this a great a great microphone, but um, it's certainly much much better than the phone. And you can record in stereo, and you can record in mid side. Um, you, it, it's it's interesting. It's got a lot of uses. Uh, I think what they came out with this one afterwards, which is hooked up with a cable, which is a little bit more versatile because you could point the microphone anywhere instead of having to point, if you're making a video, instead of having to point it at the bottom of the phone here. So, but you know, it's uh, the stuff I, I don't tell students to buy things because it's the stuff's expensive and it can become uh, a money pit, you know, um, I mean, you can just spend tons of money on this crap. I mean, yeah, I just did my taxes, and I can't believe how much money I spent last year. It's really disturbing. <laughs> so, all right. So we're going to move on at this point, uh, and just I want to review as the like MIDI and just start from the beginning and go through all of the different things that we've learned for the next hour or so, uh, so far, and maybe some other stuff will come up as I'm going through it. And... Um, Right, because this the, the track that's going to be the final project that of uh, not the final final project, but the final version of the current project is going to be due next Friday, and then I, I want to start introducing audio uh, theory and audio stuff next week in the second half of the class. So we're moving forward, 
and uh, yeah, moving forward. Okay, so, right, we open up Pro Tools, and when you open up Pro Tools, you get something called the dashboard, and this is where you can create your session, and it's got a lot of things that you can preset up in your session here. So the first thing is the title. So if I'm going to just call this uh, RSF class 6, uh, 3, 9 dash 22, oops, 3 dash 9 dash 20, 22, my initials. Now, there's also, let's zoom in on this. If you go here, you see, these are the recent projects that I've worked, which is easy to access, right? So that's kind of cool. It keeps a diary for you of your recent pro or all your recent projects, not just the, the one that you had been working on previously. So I can open up any of these, and you can see it goes back. I've got one that I, from uh, December that's in here. I opened up recently. And then you can also create from a template. Um, I'm wondering if I should show you how to make a template. Maybe I'll do that uh, as part of today's class. We'll come back to that. So now this is important because we're, we're going to be working with audio. Our file type right here, we're going to be using .wav, broadcast wave files. That's just I'm making that decision for us. AIFF, that's fine, but I use BWF and for for me, the main reason I use BWF, because most of what I do is film or television music, it has a t it embeds a timestamp onto the metadata of the file, which makes it easy for my filmmaker friends to import it into their Avid or uh, Final Cut Pro timeline and have it line up exactly in the right spot. It uses time code uh, and embeds that in the file, so that's one reason why I use it. And so. We are going to be working in our class at 44.1 sample rate, and I'll be talking, teaching you a little bit about sample rates starting next week. And our bit depth is going to be 24-bit. We are going to be using, when we start doing audio, we'll make it all interleaved. And what I want you to do, what I wanted you to do was to prompt for location, right? And what I asked you all to do is to create a folder on your desktop for the class. Whoops where all your projects would live. And I'm just going to title this right now, RSF. Come on. And so I'm going to create a session here, just like this. And I got to clean that up because I didn't have that. And that's going to go into this folder here. Okay, and here we are. And this is our Pro Tools edit window. And I'm going to go through this, and I've got this set up for myself, and I'm going to show you, I'm going to break it down and set it up so that it's better for you guys to work on your laptops, right? I've got like a 40-inch monitor, so I can, I can have a lot of stuff on my desktop. I actually have three monitors in my studio, so I can have a lot of stuff going on here. So from left, and let me move this into the middle so that we can see it, and I can zoom in on it. These are our four edit modes. So we're gonna we default to grid when we're working with MIDI, and we've been using slip a little bit, but we're gonna work with spot and shuffle uh, in when we start working with audio. So I'll explain that. This is our zoom controls. We don't need to have that out. This is these are our tools. We we do need to have that sh shown, right? This is our counter. I'm gonna I've got this set up with the count, main counter and a sub counter. So we're working on music, so we're gonna have bars and beats. So I set this up to bars and beats. I, there's also a sub counter, which I have set up for SMPTE time code, which helps me for my film work. I'm gonna hide that right now. We don't need to see that. So you'll have something that looks kind of like this. I'm also gonna hide this. This right here is our grid control. So this turns the grid on and off. And this is our grid resolution, and you can select any of these rhythmic values. You can make it dotted, triplet. You can have it be minutes and seconds, time code. 
and or clips and markers, which I've never done actually. I've just that's the first time I've seen that. So I typically leave it at bars and beats. Um, yeah, because that's what I typically work with. This is our transport. We're, we don't need to see that. We're going to use that when we record audio, though. And these are our MIDI controls. This is our synchronization controls, and this is our meter. So we do not need to see uh, the transport. We do not need to see the synchronization controls, and we do not need to see the zoom controls. So the way that you can get rid of those and streamline your toolbar, whoops, excuse me, there we go, is over here in the upper right-hand corner. There is a circle with a downward-facing triangle on it. So whenever you see something like that, a triangle or right here, there's a line with a, an arrow that points down. Whenever you see something like that, that means if you click on there, there are sub, there's a sub menu that pops up just like that. So we don't need, I'm going to get rid of the zoom controls, the transport, synchronization. And then what works with that is you save a lot of space and this is more likely to fit on your laptop than all that other stuff. And so you can see all this information here. All right, so, you know, part of learning a DAW, whether it's Logic, Cubase, Ableton, Reaper, is learning how to customize the way it looks and works to best fit your workflow. And from my perspective, the more knowledge you have about that means that you can set up a project so that it works better for that project. So if I was working on album music, I might have my Pro Tools looking a certain way. If I was going to be working on a film score, I'd have it look a different way. If I was going to be recording a voiceover, just dialogue, I probably would have the, t the, counter, the, cur the counter set at uh, minutes and seconds. So, you know, knowing how to customize and set up all these different ways that your DAW GUI can look will benefit your workflow. Okay, so this area under here, let me, I have, there's one other thing I want to get set up too. Give me one second here. There's something I want to set up. Give me one second. I thought it would, I thought I left it set up. Ah, uh. oh, here we go. Okay, let me get this on. Great. Okay. So what I've got now set up, which I think will help you out, is that if I click, you see how the cursor gets a circle around it. And then if I do a key command, Ah, there we go. Okay. Right. So now you can see there my key commands. So that'll that'll be really helpful, I think, uh, in going over this. I just discovered that app yesterday. Okay. So this is our... Um, these are our rulers under here. And these are also customizable. If you look right here, there's a downward-facing triangle, and then you can decide which ones you want to see. So... For us, we only need to see minutes and seconds, markers, tempo, meter, and we don't need to see key. 
And then that also saves you a little up and down space. So um, if we look here, this top gray line is our bar and beat ruler. And as you're looking at it now, it says one and measure five, right? If I zoom out, right, you see that it changes one and measure 17, one and measure 33. And if I zoom in, you can see how it shows every measure. These are our minutes and seconds. I always find it good to know how long a piece of music is. And that's one way you can look at that. So the way that I was zooming in is over here, there's an A and a Z. And it defaults to being grayed out. If you click on this, this is your edit keyboard focus, right? And then that gives you the ability to use the R key and the T key to zoom in and out on the timeline. Okay. Now I haven't gone over markers yet, but I am going to go over that. So these are our edit tools. We use these edit tools when we're working on audio, but they're the same tools as when we open up the MIDI editor window. So the ones that we're going to use are the trim tool, the selector tool, the grabber tool, and the pencil tool. And I've been noticing a few things, and I want to just go over this with you right now. The way I've got these set up right now is the way they should always be set up, right? Because if you look here at the trim tool and I click, there are different options. We're going to learn a little bit how to use the TCE mode, but it should be in standard mode. And what happens is that if you, if you, if you right click on that, you might accidentally change that. And the grabber tool, sometimes I'm seeing it on one of the separation or the object. We leave it on time. Now, as far as the pencil tool, we'll be using this. Uh, we, we did use this for MIDI. It's the same options here. I would say to start out with just using the line. It's easier to draw than freehand. These, uh, these different shapes here work with audio and MIDI, and these only work with audio, the bottom two. Okay. Now... That's the basic, this area down here, this is your edit page, right? This is just where you do your arranging, your editing. It gives you a, like an overview of the, uh, it gives you an overview of the timeline in Pro Tools. You'll do your audio work, audio editing on this, on this page. But as far as MIDI goes, we do that in the MIDI editor. But before we do that, I want to talk about setting up the preferences again. So... There's something called, well, the set, we'll go to the setup menu. So there's the hardware setup or the playback engine, right? Now, you guys don't need to have the video engine turned on, so that can be disabled. Your playback engine so far has been most likely the internal Mac, Mac, so I have a Mac Pro, so it says Mac Pro speakers. When we start working with the audio interface, you'll have to go here and select your audio interface. So I'm using right now, I've got a, a several audio interfaces, right? I'm using the Universal Audio Thunderbolt, which is, um, this right here. That's my audio interface. You guys, if you've gotten something from the school, it's most likely a Scarlet. It's a red, red one. You would select that there, and we'll go over that uh, probably starting in a couple of weeks, not next week. The hardware buffer size. Now, this the buffer puts data into a buffer inside the computer, and um, that the larger the buffer, the more data gets put in there, and then that takes the load off of the CPU. So that if I had, let's say, I have this set for 64 samples right now, which is very, very small, and when I press the key on my MIDI keyboard, it almost feels instantaneous. 
you can change it to any of these other sizes. And what happens is, let's say you've got a computer that's not so powerful and you might be working at 256 samples, you'll see that there'll be errors, the, the, the audio will stop, it'll hang up, there'll be pops and clicks and all sorts of stuff. You would fix that by playing around with the buffer size. And let's not worry about this stuff right now. But the, these two things, uh, well, turning the video engine off, you don't need to have that on because that eats up CPU. And the, your audio, your playback engine and your buffer size. Now, don't change the playback set, set engine for, for this next uh, pro, for the project we're working on now uh, or for the next project. We'll change this when we actually start recording audio, which will be in a few weeks still. So that's the playback engine. And if we go down to the I.O., when you uh, enable the audio interface, you're going to have to set this up. And if you get a project from somebody else, their I.O. will overtake yours. So if you look right here, I've got a bunch of things in what's called the bus, right? I want to make that default so I can just click right here and you'll notice that everything changed to what's default for my particular setup. And then if I do that for the output and for the input, right, everything is set up to, to what I've got selected as my audio interface. And if I click OK, that just fixes, cleans everything up. And then the last thing for setup is you go to preferences right here, and this opens up the preference page. And up here, there are tabs to go to different pages here, right? You don't have to worry about any of these. You just have to go to our display. And we want tooltips turned on, function and details. This way, if you hover over something, it'll tell you what the name of it is. I We organize plugin menus by category and manufacturer. That's just something I do. It makes it easier to find things. And then over here, color coding, always display marker colors, MIDI note color shows velocity, and then the default track color coding, your tracks and MIDI channels have colors, and then the clips inside of the track should be the same color as the track, so that default color coding is the same as the track color, which is this here. And the only other thing is if you go to MIDI, make sure to click automatically create a click track in new sessions right here. So that's basically our setup. Hit OK. And then the next time you boot up Pro Tools, all of those will be um, in effect. Now, I have Pro Tools set up so that it automatically set, opens up a click track in my new session, right? So I've got a click track already set up here. Now, this is something I haven't uh, talked to you about. Let me go here and let me... This is another thing. This is the metronome. It turns it on and off, right? Gray is off. Blue is on. If you double click on that, it gives you the options. I usually have it set to only during record so that if I'm playing something back, I'm not getting the annoying click track. And then have your count off set up so that it only is active when you are recording, not all the time. Don't worry about these. Uh, this is if you want to use an external module to create a click track, which nobody does anymore in typical practice. Okay, great. So... That's now on, but what I want to do is I want to have it on during play and record for what I'm about to show you. So if you double, if you click there, this is our click track, right? And if I record enable this, give me one sec. So you can hear my click going right now, right? And that's a different sound than what you guys are used to. And the way that you can change that is you'll notice that right here, these are the two sounds, and you have to do it to both. You can click on here, and then you've got all these different sounds that you can set up for your 
click track, right? So if I wanted to make it a shaker. So on the downbeat, you see I'm getting the shaker. One, one, two, three, four, one. And then the rest of the click track, which is click two, which is giving me this MP3. So if I wanted to change that. Right, so you can emphasize where the downbeat is if you want. That'll help you. I just like the um, MPC or the Yuri click. They remind me of being in uh, in a, a big studio. And what you can do is you can change the volume of the accent by clicking and dragging here. So you can, you know, that, that can help you out when you're playing. All right. So let me uh, instantiate a new instrument track. Okay. So it's command, shift, right? You see that the, down here, the command and the shift are lit and N new and there's the key command right there one new and we're always working in stereo for instrument tracks stereo instrument tracks now I, this is one thing i didn't show you but there are presets that you can select so let's say i wanted to open up mini grand if i click here you'll see it says track presets avid i have my own presets a couple here that i've made um, but if you go to Air Instruments Bundle, you can see that it says Mini Grand, right? So you can open this up, and then you can actually select any of the preset sounds right here. So let's say I do Soft Piano. Hit Create. Did I do it right? Apparently not. There we go. And notice that when it opens up, it opens up with the right, with the correct name. It names it what the preset was. So that's kind of cool. Now, you notice here that when the name has a white background, that means it's active. And you can see right here in the tracks list that uh, this is highlighted. So if you hold the option key down and click, that unhighlights it. And when you fin it, nothing, when, you, when you're done, nothing should be, and you're, you're saving it, nothing should be highlighted. So you can resize the track multiple ways, right? If you hover below here, you see that the, the cursor changes to a cross. You can click and drag down. If you click here, in that keyboard, you can see that you've got all these different options. So if I wanted to make it extreme, or if I wanted to make it micro, or if I wanted to make it small. Alternatively, I can hold down the control, the option, and hit the up arrow to make them all bigger and the down arrow to make them all smaller. And that's what I typically do. I try to use the mouse as little as possible. Key commands are your friend. You know? Okay. Now. You can customize what you see in this area here. And you can do that by clicking on this downward facing triangle. And the way that I've got this set up is with instrument inserts A through E. We don't really need to have sends yet, so you could have that off if you need more space. And for MIDI, you don't really need to have the audio outputs set up if you want to save space. And track color. 
Now, I like to leave the track color on, and the way that you change the track color is by clicking on this border here, and it brings up a palette. Now, if you guys have newer version of Pro Tools, there's a lot you can do with the color, but some people don't, so I'll just stick with the basic palette here. And it gives you just all these different colors, and you can just click. Now, for MIDI tracks, I would avoid some of these very bright colors because it makes it very difficult to see the MIDI notes and the velocity stalks in the editors. That's, that would be some of these colors up here. If you want it greenish, just go down a level or two. Right? Now, if you do not have whoops, the track color turned on, right? This border doesn't have a color on it anymore. So you could change this and this stays black. But if you want to have that, you turn the track color on there and you can see it. Now, a couple things we haven't talked about, but I'm going to talk about right now is that right here, this is record enable. This is solo and this is mute. This right here is the track view selector. For MIDI, it should always be on clips. We don't, we don't need to see all this stuff here. It just gets really sloppy. We'll be using some of these other views for when we do audio tracks. Don't have to worry about... This is for automation right here. You don't have to worry about this. This is track freeze. I don't cover that this semester. And this is the time-based selector, which I cover in Audio MIDI 1. But basically, um, instruments come up as ticks and audio tracks come up as samples. When we want to use Elastic Audio, we change audio tracks to samples, but I don't cover that in this class. That's part of Audio MIDI 1. Right here, this is kind of a useless area. This is Patch Select. And this is a throwback to older synthesizers with preset banks. You can do a patch change right here to uh, like an external synthesizer that has uh, a built-in patch memory so you could send out program change memory program change over here this is our instrument column this this tells you the input so any any MIDI device that you've got hooked up right here it will receive MIDI from so for me personally I have uh, my piano keyboard that has MIDI and I also have this little controller here that sends out MIDI that I do automation with. And each one of these controls on here, there are sliders, faders, and there are knobs, and there are little buttons. I've got these set up to transmit MIDI information, and I've got them all labeled so that I know what the MIDI number is. But, for example, right here, if I click on this, it will mute my mic in my feed. I don't think it mutes it in your feed, but if I... Like, I couldn't hear my mic at that point once I clicked on that. So that's a great way to quickly mute the mic if I'm taking a drink of water. It doesn't get on the review video for sure. So this is a MIDI device that I've got an input, and I've got my piano controller. So if I zoom in on this, and I go to predefined, right, you see this, is, this, the, this thing is the nano control with the sliders and the knobs, and this is my... Yamaha YC key keyboard and it's so all of these things are active there might be times where you only want to have something one thing active uh, yeah sure let me send that PDF again you know I'll upload the PDF into uh, onto the OneDrive okay so it'll be in class 6 materials uh, alright Z Tan. Um, okay. And then you can also mute over here, but that'll just mute the MIDI that's being sent out on this track. And that's got other uses, which are beyond what this class is. So right here, this is the instrument selector right here. 
right? It comes to default to the one that you've got plugged in. This is MIDI volume and MIDI pan, which is different than audio volume. We're not working with audio volume or audio pan when we're doing MIDI instruments. When we do audio instruments, we work with those. Okay. So I want to uh, record something. So I'm going to set my count up off to one bar. And I like to figure out, I have to hit the return uh, key so that I get back to the beginning of the session. So this is at 120 beats a minute. So if I want to figure out my tempo, what I can do is uh, click right here on the add tempo change, right? And it brings up the tempo change here. And then I can rough out a tempo by tapping on the letter T on your computer keyboard. So let's say I wanted to play something at, right? One and two and three and four and one and two. And you see how it's changing now? So I'm about 82, right? So I'll just rough that out and then just fine tune it like that. And then you'll see that my conductor track is now at 82. So if I want to record something, I need to record enable the track over here. So I click on that and you'll see that there's a red blinking light. And again, this is highlighted. I don't need to have that highlighted, so I will just option click it. And I'm going to, there's several ways to start recording. I told you about turning off spotlight. And if you've done that, you would be able to hit command and space bar. If you've got an extended keyboard, you can hit three. Alternatively, if you've got the function key set up, you can go to preferences, and I don't teach this, but you can, oh, right, this is wait for note. We're not using wait for note because that's broken, uh, and that should be fixed, but who knows when that'll happen. So I'll, I, I'll pretend that I've got a laptop. Now, if you're going to record on keyboard or any instrument, before you start recording, you need to make sure that you're comfortable and that you have access to everything you need. So for me personally, I need access to my sustain pedal, which is under the keyboard, right? So, you know, from playing it, it moves because it's, it's hooked up with a cable and not uh, on an acoustic piano, like part of the instrument itself where it doesn't move. So I just reach down and grab and make sure it's there. And when you're getting ready to record, during the play-in, what I think is really best to do is to start to feel the time and the subdivision. Don't, just don't do a count off and then start playing, right? So let me uh, change the count off to, to two bars so I can demonstrate this, right? So if I go to, if I do command and space bar, you're going to hear eight clicks and I'm going to start playing on the ninth click. So one, two, three. So doon chicka doon chicka doon chicka doon chicka doon chicka doon chicka doon right so I just play that simple chord thing and let me zoom in and what I did was I heard and felt the time before I started playing, and my time is pretty good. It's a little ahead of the beat in a few spots, right? But it's still... Oh, let me turn off that click so it's only during record. Now, if you want to record over... If you want to do another take, what you can do is just start recording, and it will record over that. It will erase it automatically, right? But if I want to get rid of that, I could double click on that and just hit the delete key and it will just get rid of it all. Okay. But you haven't erased the MIDI track, right? This is something that I haven't taught you yet. Is on the left and on the right, you have lists. And on the left, you have the tracks list. And this will be a list of all the tracks that you've got in the session. So right now I've got a click track and a soft piano. And you can see right here, it's click track and soft piano. So those are there. Over in this area, you've got your clips, right? And you could see I've got over here something that says soft piano one, and that was the take I just did. So if I take this and drag it right here, you see that my clip, I didn't erase it from the memory. I just deleted it off the timeline. Right, so I could delete this, 
it's gone, it's still here. So that's pretty cool. These now, let me just show you. Um, so when you look at the clips, there's all this hieroglyphics here on these columns. The first one is a little green, looks like a Christmas tree, but it's actually a metronome. And that will let you know that the time base is ticks. And so if I hover, you can see right there, time base ticks. And right here, this lets me know that this is a MIDI clip because it's got it's got uh, a, a DIN cable. So what is a DIN cable? That this is tangential, but uh, I just taught this in Audio MIDI one. Here, let me show you. This is actually a, a MIDI cable, right? And if you look at the connector, let's see, will that focus? Come on, I'm focusing my thing. Hold on. <laughs> there, you can see that inside of that, right, it's got those pins. Right, that's the same as this high, this this icons up here, right? That's the 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 DIN, it's called a DIN collector connector in real in real world. Okay. So that's and then if this was an audio track, it would look different. These two would look different, these hieroglyphics, and I'll show you that uh probably starting next week. Okay, so I'm gonna do another take and I'm going to play something uh with a little bit more rhythm to it. Maybe I'll play something that has a broken arpeggio and I'll play a very simple uh a very simple line. All right. So um, let me also show the camera so you can see me doing this all at once. All right, so I'm getting set before I do anything, taking a breath, being calm and peaceful. And that's very, very important is to be focused and not have your mind racing around, not having a lot of distractions in your work area. And okay, I'm hearing the subdivisions. to take. Now, if we look there, I'm only seeing a little part of that. If I want to see the entire timeline, control, option, and the letter A. See that? And then everything fits in the timeline. Control, option, and the letter A. Let's say I wanted to zoom in on a very specific spot, like right here. Control, Option, and the letter F like fit. See how that fits that in right there? Okay. So, again, knowing these keyboard commands, no matter what software you're using, helps you to navigate so much quicker, right? Not dealing with the mouse. The mouse is great, but as much with this as possible will speed up your whole workflow. Okay, so that was pretty good. I like it, but I want to edit that a little, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down into this area here. Let me just make this smaller and zoom in. Right down here, there's a horizontal line and an upward-facing arrow. I'm going to click on that, and that's going to open up the MIDI editor. And this is our MIDI editor here. Now, you'll notice here on, on the tracks list, right, it has columns. So you see how everything is, like, they're, they're all similar, all these different lists, right? They've got very similar properties to them, so that if you learn one, it's easier for you to learn the rest. So the hieroglyphics here is 
this little dot here means that that's what's visible. So if I click and deactivate that, you'll see these MIDI notes disappear. If I want to see them, I have to activate them by clicking on them. This right here is the color of the track. It's blue. You can see that right here, the border is blue and the notes are blue. This little orange and black thing, that's like, you know, the C, C sharp, D, D sharp, and E of a piano. That lets you know that that's an instrument track. The click track has a little downward facing arrow. That lets you know that it's an AUG's input. And I'll go over that. We'll be going over that. Just It's just a different bit. And then two soft piano. It's got the little pencil that lets you know when you're here that that's the track that's being edited. When you zoom out, you can see that. So this is our edit window. And to navigate left and right, there's a little bar. Let me, make, let me get rid of myself so that you can see this a little better. There's a bar that you can scroll left and right here. You can also, now let me uh, go back here. I can, I'm using the mouse right here, going left and right on the mouse. If you've got a mouse, if you have a touchpad, which I've got right here, and let me move the touchpad over here. So it's a little, no, let me keep it here, right? I can do the same thing with a touch. Well, I got to get the, notice I have to get the cursor in there and it's two fingers left and right, and up and down also. So that works with the, with the trackpad as well. Okay, so let me zoom out. Now, you can resize. Let me make this uh, the size of here. Now, this may open up small like this. If you hover in this border here, that the cursor will turn to a cross and you can click and drag up and make it fairly large. Right. And then the R key and the T key work with this. Now, this also has a toolbar. And then there's another bit that I want to show you over here. If you click here, and let me zoom in on this so it's easier for you to see. Right here, if you click on this, you can go to scrolling. And you want to scroll, set it to scroll on page. And why does that work? Because that is how we look at, read a book. So if I zoom on, on this and I play this back, you'll see that when the playback head gets to the end of the timeline over here, it will flip the page, sort of. So you can see how that is easy to follow. What I would avoid is setting this up for continuous because that becomes like this. I, I, that's hard for me to follow personally speaking, that makes me seasick. Um, but you, if, if that's the way you want to look at it, that's fine. But I just would recommend a uh, page. Okay, so we've got a toolbar up here as well. And this toolbar is for the MIDI editor. So let me zoom in. And you'll notice around the toolbar, there is a gold border. That means that this area is, and these tools are active. If I zoom out and I click up here, this is no longer, doesn't, it's no longer active. There's no gold bar there. The gold bar has moved to this play, to this uh, toolbar up here. Okay, so if you're, you, if this is active up here and you're trying to do something down here, uh, it's not going to work. You got to click here and change. So now this is active and we're not seeing the piano because you'll notice that this dot is not on. So I turn that on and we can see our piano notes. Now, this next bit, if ne this next bit gets a little funky, is I'm going to try to change the size of the notes. 
so that I can see them all. So now I can see all the notes in there. Okay, so see the problem with this is you can't reset these. This is this is definitely like a bug in Pro Tools. All right, that's fine. So I want to um, edit these. Now, we've been doing a couple of things. So right here, we want to activate our grid. And you'll notice that I've got the grid set up for um, 16th notes, which is 240 ticks. So I'm, I didn't play, I only played eighth notes. So I'm going to change that to eighth notes. And then now you'll notice on the, with the grid, right? Uh, you'll notice that there is one grid between each beat and that the, the grid is color coded. So let's say we start at measure two, right? On every beat, the grid line is darker. On the subdivisions of the beat, the grid line is lighter. And at every downbeat, the grid line is the darkest. So there's three levels of darkness to the grid line. There's the darkest one, which is on every downbeat. There's the next, the, the you know, the, the next lightest one is on each beat, and the lightest one is on the subdivisions. So you'll notice here that there's a lot that can be done to this to make this performance better. And so we, what we first started doing was we went to grid mode, and I just showed you guys to sort of snap things to grid to get your rhythmic uh, your rhythmic values perfect, right? And that's okay using the trim tool. Um, excuse me. <coughs> Sorry about that. There is also a way to fix this. There's several ways to fix this, right? We can, I can look and I can see that I'm consistently early in this measure here, from here to here, right? So what I can do is I can select all of these notes by clicking and dragging, right? And then going to the very first note, clicking. Now I'm, I'm not holding down any other key, any other keys, and just dragging this so that snaps on the grid. And you notice that it's much better now, right? It's not perfect, but it's much better, and that might be fine. So I can quickly go through this and look at where I'm ahead of the beat and just select. Whoops, make sure I select all those. <coughs> Excuse me. And so I can quickly go through like that and do that. Now, there's also event operations. And there's two places to find the event operations window. The first one is up here, time, and you can go to t event operations right here. And each one of these notes is an event, right? A MIDI event. Each one of these notes is a different event. And you can go to event operations, and then you've got a list of all the different ways that you can play around with. We're not going to go through all of these. We're only going to go through a couple of these right now. And you'll notice that only a few of them have key commands. So what I typically do is I've got a few of these memorized. So option zero brings up quantize. Option T brings up transpose. Option P brings up change duration. So I've got those memorized. You only really need to memorize one, and option zero is a good one. It brings up events. It brings up quantize. But if you wanted to change to any of the other ones, there's a rectangle with a downward facing tri triangle we can change over here just quickly very change change things quickly so i want to quantize this that means that it will automatically snap all these notes to the closest grid and we want to select our quantize grid value i'm playing eighth notes so i'm going to select this to eighth notes and you can you you would then have to select everything which is command a and then hit apply. And that will make all the rhythm perfect 
you still have to double check it because if your rhythm is really bad, you may get quantized to the wrong eighth note. But I think that that sounds mechanical. So what you can do is you can quantize and you can use strength. And let's say it's 90%, right? What you can do is anything that's 10, within 10% 10 of a grid doesn't get fixed and then it doesn't put everything exactly on the grid, right? You can see that these are this, these notes here are still a little before the grid, but everything is better. It maintains some of like some of my human feel. So that's a little better, right? Um, you know, I probably wouldn't have really quantized it because it, it, it sounded fine to me. Now, I want to listen to this, and I want to listen to how I did the performance and see about how I can um, improve my performance. And the, the main thing is making sure that my phrasing is good and the balance between my hands is good and that I'm bringing out any melodic content, right? Because this is uh, left-hand bass notes and a broken arpeggio in the right hand, right? But that's... Three, that's actually three elements because the broken arpeggio has a melodic content and a rhythmic content. So the first note or the highest note in this case, I would typically consider as the melodic content. So you want to have something that sort of gives you a little bit more of. Right, so you could hear. You could hear that I was playing that melodic part and I'm also balancing when I'm playing my left hand it's present but it's not right which is inappropriate it, it, that's not what's happening you know I mean there may be times where you want to go climax of the song but you know right here it's this is just a quiet introspective beginning and I want to make sure that I've got those three elements covered so I'm going to listen and okay so right away this note on beat four is too loud and we did a setup where we went up preferences where we have <clears throat> MIDI note color shows velocity. So you can do this by looking. You can see here that this note here is darker. That means that it's louder. Right? So I can <coughs> change the velocity multiple ways. If I've got the grabber tool selected, if I hover over this note and hold... Uh, the command tool down, you see that it changes to a sideways trimmer. I can click and just drag and bring that down. And if you look in this area here, so let me zoom in a little bit, you'll see a number value. Uh, let's see. You see that? So that's 64, so maybe I'll bring that down a little bit more. So now let's listen. And if I want this to be a little bit louder, I would right. So I'm I'm hearing now, ba ba ya ba ya. That's great. Now, what about my left hand? Well, what I can do, uh, it sounds pretty good, but the second one is a little soft. I can tell by the color. So I can lasso. By clicking and dragging both of those, hold down my command and up. And let's hear that now. And then my bass note here is too soft, so I can make that a little bit, little bit louder, but not too much. And you can see how that now sounds much better.
And with a figure like this where I'm resting, I might just want to have this first note be really loud. And then just the rest of these be uh, to just like a you know just like a like a guitar flat picking, finger picking. And then right here, I want to get that a little louder. And then this is these I, I can I'm I've been doing this for years. It just you know it, it really I can do this stuff really quickly. You just need practice. It's not rocket science. You guys will all get it. I can tell by the work you've done already. That you're all getting it so it's just it's just very the more you do it the quicker you'll get at it so i can look at these and just tell you know that like i can just look at these and i can hear and i can tell by the color and just quickly edit and this is too soft here and this is too loud so i you know you could just really rebalance your performance now, you know, I'm a pianist, so I would probably practice this a little bit and get a better performance, but most of you are not pianists, and this is a way where you can use the tools involved to make your performance better. And, you know, this, it's not cheating, right? We saw in the beginning of this class where they captured sounds and manipulated them in the studio to come up with performances with, by the way, playing tapes backwards, by changing the speed, by putting it through filters... And by make I, we, I didn't talk about tape loops, but that was another. Professor Musgrave talked about those, but that was another way that things got manipulated. So just using the tools available to create a performance. That's sort of you know what all this stuff is here for. So I may do a little bit more MIDI review next week, um, but I just wanted to go over all those basic things right now. Um, and I think that that's a pretty good spot to, to leave it because the, the quant, oh, um, yeah, I actually, maybe I will spend, a, let me spend a little bit more time and show you a couple of other things. Let, let's do this. So let's say that I like this performance and I want to change the velocity of everything. Well, you know that if you click here, it brings up the, 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 the MIDI editing lanes. This used to be called a strip chart and this also can be resized. And I could just click in here, select all, and I could just bring everything down like that, right? And make everything soft, softer. But I can also call up my event operations, which is I'm doing a command and zero. Uh, no, I'm sorry, option and zero. And I can go to change velocity right here. Right? And if I wanted to, say, make everything softer... I could subtract 15, right? And just type that in like that, hit enter, and then you'd have to hit apply or hit enter a second time. And then everything's softer. Or if I wanted to undo that, it's command Z. And let's say I wanted to make that a lot softer. So I'd say I'd subtract 30 from everything, hit enter. Whoops, I'm sorry. 30. Now see how that's highlighted? Hit enter. So that's no longer highlighted then you can either click on apply or hit enter a second time. And that's much softer. There's a lot of other functionality here, um, but that that's the basic one, subtracting or adding, or you could scale by. So if I wanted to scale everything by, make it all a little bit louder, let's say 120%, hit enter, and then hit apply. So that's another quick way to do that. Now, let me, let's do something here. Whoops. Okay, so I've got these notes here. I've got these three notes here, right? I just selected them. What if I wanted to make them all longer, right? I could use the trim tool and just drag them out. Just like that. But if I wanted to change the note duration, well, I can go to change duration. And I, if I wanted to set everything to be four bars long, I could that's 16 beats. Hit enter and then hit apply and there it is. Right? Oh, I see. Let me do that one more time. There we go. 
So everything is now 16 beats. So you can do that. Now, what this is really good for is for drum programming. And let me just show you what I mean by that. I, did I go over this with you last week? Or did I do that with Audio MIDI 1? You guys have some overlapping content, so it's hard for me to remember. But let's say, I, let me do this. I'm going to call up another uh, stereo instrument track. And then I'm just going to put uh, Expand 2 in really quickly. And then let's just go to uh, Drums, and I'll just go, let's say, um, Pop Kit. And let me just mute this. And I'm just going to well, name this drums. Okay. So let me just do a quick drum beat, right? Whoops. Damn. See, I didn't, I didn't get my groove happening. So let me color code that a different color. And let me uh, click here and get my drums. And let me zoom in on that. Now, uh, drums, you hit them, and no matter how long, how long you push the note down, they're programmed to do the entire length of the sample. So if I hold it down, that's, it's, it's the same length. So, you know, I want to, I like to see all my drums be the same note length. It just is easier. So what I can do is select all of these and then call up the uh, change duration. And I can set all of these, like if I set these all to 240, which would be a 16th note in duration, right? You could see that they're all the same length now and it won't change the performance at all. And then if I wanted to... Uh, Make that a little bit more rhythmically accurate. And there you go. So you could change note duration. You could do all sorts of stuff in the event uh, operations. You know, that's in Audio MIDI 1. I spend much more time going through that. Um, I'm just starting to work on that now. We'll have probably another uh, two, three weeks worth of, two or three weeks worth of MIDI work with uh, Audio MIDI 1. And we're doing a little bit more detailed stuff. But just to give you a, a taste of that, this is more of a survey class. So, um, all right. So that's like a, a rever like a um, a uh, a review of. Um, hold on. Let me pop. The, I'm going to pop this up on our class materials, but I just sent this again. So see if you can download that now. Let me put it in class materials right now. So it'll be in class six. Okay, it's right there right now if you need to get it. All right, so um, you know if you if you uh, try to get your project your first draft in before you go to bed tonight because I will be getting up tomorrow and you know probably getting on it in the morning uh, when I get up. Well, not exactly when I get up when I get back from walking the dog. Let's put it that way. Um, yeah. So all right, that that would be the end of today's class. Any questions? Yay, nay. You know, I think that that stuff is kind of interesting about the music concrete and the electronic the beginnings of electronic music. You know, the, the whole evolution of the recording studio is such an uh, interesting and how it changed how we consume music. It's it's very very interesting to me. It's like it's and you know, recorded music actually uh, you know, World War II had a big part in how the how uh, the quality of recording music changed and I'll go over that as well. So, all right, everyone, thank you so much. Uh, everyone have a great night.
and I will catch you next week. I'll have feedback videos up and everything. I'll let you know. All right. Catch you Thank later. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. See you.